Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast, the first and longest running female hosted hunting podcast. She's all geared up and ready to chase walleyes in the middle of the night on the Wisconsin River. But first, she's helping you navigate your trip of a lifetime. And now, here's your hostess, Carrie Zilka. So before we jump into the episode, I just wanted to remind you that this podcast is made possible by my partnership with a few very select companies. My title sponsor for 2022 is Spy Point Trail Cameras. So if you love me and you love what I'm doing with this podcast, please go to huntfishtravel.com slash spypoint. And as always, I'd like to thank Montana Decoy, Radians, and Realtree for helping me keep the lights on. You can find links to all of my sponsors at huntfishtravel.com slash sponsors. Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast. I am your hostess, Carrie Z. I am super excited for this week's episode. We are on the line with Brett Amundsen, who is a television host at the Prairie Outdoorsman. And we are going to talk about bird hunting because he posts the most fabulous photos of him and his dogs bird hunting. So, Brett, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I you know what? I, when I've got dogs that look as good as they do, it makes my picture taking so much easier. Like, right? I, I, you know, it's <laughs> it's all them, really. Let's be honest. They're awesome dogs. And so, why don't why don't we explain to the listeners why we're all so obsessed with your dogs? Everything from let's see, when when was the first time? I think I met your older dog. Um, must have been Surgeon Spearing, two thousand and. Yeah, I was going to say certain spring for sure, but I can't remember the year. I know. It was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps getting longer. I, know. I can't believe how long it, how long ago it's been. You know, I, I shared that video on, on Facebook here uh, recently, and even that's going to be four years old now, I think. I know. It's time flies when you're having fun. Way too fast. Well, and even your new puppy... Um, like she has her own Instagram account, correct? Yeah, <laughs> she's she's kind of a diva, kind of a big deal. I don't know if you know this or not, but yeah. So my older dog is is Mika. Uh, she just turned 11 here a couple of weeks ago in, in January, and then uh, the new dog is Tiny. She's about a year and a half now, and her nick her her nickname in the litter was Tiny because she was the smallest of 10 pups, and uh, it was my buddy's litter, Corey Loeffler. And uh, so I went up and visited a couple of times, and it was uh, Corey, his wife, and his daughters that kind of take care of these litters when he has them. And uh, his one daughter, we had give them, given them all nicknames. They all have colored collars, and that's kind of how they tell them all apart. But a couple of them get, get nicknames here and there. And, you know, the whole time I was, you know, I got her about seven weeks, and I was trying to figure out what I, what I wanted to name her. And coming up with a name for anything is hard. You can, you probably know that. Yeah. And, and then name, you know, naming a dog, you know, or, you know, this is something that's going to be with you for a long time and you want to come up with the right name. And I was just racking my brain and I was up there one day, uh, the week, I think it was the weekend I was picking her up and, uh, the puppies are running around this chaos, like a litter of 10 puppies can be labs <laughs> and they're yellow labs, by the way. And, uh, I heard Corey's daughter yell at tiny and called her tiny and the dog stopped turned and looked at her so she already was recognizing you know that that was her name that's why i can't change it now plus she's the smallest dog with the biggest attitude so the name (laughs) tiny fit perfectly that's awesome she's a lot of fun yeah have you always had dogs have you always had um bird dogs you know we we grew up with some dogs when i was a kid and then when i was in high school we had a lab yeah, all of our dogs got run over. Uh, oh pretty God. much every dog we owned growing up. Yeah, every one of them. And uh, so when I was in high school, we had a seven-year-old lab that was, you know, it was our hunting dog, but it was also, you know, I, I treat them as members of the family. My dogs live in the house. Um, they can sleep on the bed. They, I don't have them on the furniture, but they do sleep on the bed. They, a lot of times they'll ride in the front seat, um, whatever. So they're members of the family. And, and when that seven-year-old lab, Dusty, got hit by a car it was it was it hit the whole family pretty hard my parents said you know what we're not doing this anymore 
And, uh, and then I got into radio and bounced around from radio job to radio job. And I was moving and I was living, living in apartments for a while. And that's no place to, to have a, a hunting dog and have a lab. So I kind of kept putting it off until I, until I owned my first house. And then once I did that, I got my first dog, which was Mika. So really I've, I've had two of my own, um, after having uh, a few of them when I was growing up. So had had one now for about uh, yeah 11 years I guess and I I waited I wish I would have done it sooner but I wanted to make sure that the dog had the right amount of space and time I guess I want to make sure I had enough time to give to the dog yeah and radio jobs don't really allow for much free time so it took a while for me to finally get my own but uh, I wish I would have done it sooner but I'm glad I finally did that's awesome and that is a good point I guess. I have cats because I'm gone so much, a lot of hunting trips and stuff where it's not really, I don't know, it's just too much airplane time and stuff, you know, so I don't know Mm -hmm. that for my lifestyle, a dog would be, it it would just be neglected in my opinion. So I have cats, but again, I don't, I don't do a lot of bird hunting Which should be neglected, by the way. I'm just saying, (laughs) cats should be neglected. My Velcro cats after I'm gone a couple of days, you'd think I was gone for a month. (laughs) <laughs> the, the, <laughs> um, but I, I just have never done like a lot of bird hunting. I'm sure that if I was a, du- a huge duck hunter or a big pheasant hunter, I would probably mo- be more inclined to get a dog. So, yeah. I mean, do you do a lot more bird hunting than say deer hunting or turkey hunting or? Oh, for sure. I mean, yeah. I, I turkey hunt and I deer hunt too. I bow hunt quite a bit. Um, but the beauty of that is, you don't, you know, you don't need a dog for it, which is nice. Um, I definitely didn't pheasant hunt as much until, uh, until I got a dog or until I moved to North Dakota, really. And then I really got into pheasant hunting and I was kind of relying upon going with my buddies that had good dogs and, um, pheasant hunting without a dog is, is doable, but not recommended. Um, yeah. pheasants will run, um, and, and never flush without a dog. And, uh, and then if you do shoot one, and they happen to run a little bit, you'll never find that without a dog. And half yeah. the time, even if you knock them down in, in heavy cover, they're hard to find without a dog. So I don't really recommend pheasanting without a dog, at least in the group. So I didn't do it much. And then I got, and I was more of a waterfowl hunter anyway. And uh, I remember hunting in North Dakota one day, and I was getting to the point where I wanted to get a dog anyway. And I was hunting a little slough, and I shot a mallard that landed out in the water. And I walked out, I had to walk out. It was windy. It was cold. You know, your typical waterfowl. When you picture a waterfowl day and it's gray and raining sideways, that's pretty much what it was like. And I'm walking out in the middle of the slough and to get to where this mallard was floating, water was at as far up on my waders as it can get without filling my waders up. So I'm tiptoeing. <laughs> I'm tiptoeing through this slough, trying not to go over my waders. And I was able to reach the duck. And as I'm, and then I, as I turned around, I had a wave crash over the top of my wader. So I pulled water, <laughs> filling my waders. Thankfully, it wasn't deeper, and uh, I was able to make it back to shore. And I had to take my waders off as soon as I got to shore. And my my socks were freezing up. It was cold. Yeah. And uh, that was the day I said, "Yeah, this is this is happening. It's it's time to get a dog." <laughs> because they don't care. They just don't care. No, like, they, you know? they love it. Yeah. Yeah hilarious that's too funny what what do you think is your favorite species to hunt probably snow geese Uh, they're my favorite they're my i love them but i hate them equally (laughs) like they're 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 probably one of the toughest waterfowl species to hunt but when they do it there's nothing like it how so hardest how so well uh the thing with snow geese You'll, you'll hear people talk about having to put out a thousand decoys. And generally that's true. You can get away in certain situations with a smaller decoy spread, but a lot of times you have to go with numbers. Um, snow geese, particularly, uh, what we call lead edge birds or adult birds, they're in a rush to, uh, fly south for the migration. And when they, you know, generally when I hunt them is in the spring during the conservation season when they're on the way back up and they follow the snow line and those lead edge snow geese that are following that snow line back north, those are the breeding adults. 
and they are <clears throat> they are all sorts of worked up and anxious to get north, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So they just push and push and push, and they fly in flocks of thousands. And when they're migrating like that in those big flocks, they essentially, a flock of snow geese works almost as a single unit. So you'll see them and they'll look like a swarm of bees off in the distance or a swarm of blackbirds. And say you got a thousand geese in one flock, that's 2,000 eyeballs. And if those birds, uh, some, some of those birds live to 30 years old. So some of those birds are probably an average around seven to 10, but some of them could be over 20, 20 to 30 years old, they get shot at nine months out of the year, all the way down the migration, all the way back up it. So nine months out of the year. So if that bird is, you know, say uh, 25 years old or whatever, for whatever the math works out to be 20 some years of its life, it's been getting shot at. So now you've got that many old birds that have seen decoy spreads and they're just, they're impossible to decoy. So that's why you, here people want to go after the juvies or the young birds that haven't been hunted as hard. They're not as smart, smaller groups. They're easily uh, decoyable compared to the adults. So snow geese are probably my favorite, but I am. So uh, mallards have become a real close second uh, when it comes to waterfowl, uh, late season mallards, particularly because they, they, they fly uh, almost like snows in big groups. You can hunt them in cornfields. Uh, field hunting mallards, it doesn't get much better than that. You know, 100 to 500 birds spinning around you, dropping in. And then they they look cool and they're delicious. They're about one of the best tasting waterfowl, you know, one of the best ducks that you'll get. It probably hands down the best duck that you'll be able to eat. Uh, sure. Late season mallards, they get, they get fatty. It leaves the skin on. It's unreal. But pheasants are, are right up there. Those three are probably my top three. It's hard to pick a favorite. But I would say those three are at the top and pheasants for a completely different reason. Uh, I've become definitely addicted to pheasant hunting. Um, I, I live in decent pheasant country, so I, I don't have to travel. I like to tell people I live where people travel to to hunt. You know, uh, it's not South Dakota. It's not, you know, crazy numbers or anything, but it's it's good enough that I can walk out on an afternoon for about an hour and, and at least see some birds. So I've, I've got ample opportunity. And I love the places. But I think this when people ask me, oh, I like the pheasant hunt so much, uh, because some people think, some people don't, that don't do it. They don't always understand it. You know, oh, you're just chasing colorful chickens around. The thing is, is that watching the dogs work is half the hunt. Going into places that the majority of people on this planet have probably never stepped foot is probably about 30% of it. And seeing things, you know, you'll see all sorts of wildlife when you're walking on the back, maybe you're on the back stretch of a public piece of property. You know, I always had back for the thickest, gnarliest, heaviest cover, and it's usually in two feet of snow. And you know, nobody else is ever going to go back there. Yeah. So you put yourself in places that a lot of people will never go. And you get to see things that a lot of people never get to see. And you're doing it with your dog. A lot of times I hunt by myself. So it's kind of a nice, it's a nice way to relax and get away and um, kind of escape and, and, and be in the wild for a little while. It's fun to do it with friends and family too. But um, it's a, uh, I really enjoy it just cause, and it's my gym. Honestly, I hate the gym. I can't, I can't I do it. So, so pheasant hunting is my exercise. That's awesome. I love, I do enjoy pheasant hunting. Obviously, I usually have to go to one of the farms with dogs that I can rent, you know, but it is, it's just the prettiest time of the year. It's usually a little warm, yeah. you know, it's cold, cool in the morning, but then it's warm in the afternoon and you're walking and it's just, it's pretty awesome. I do love. I remember the, yeah, I remember the first time I hunted in, um, I think it was in North Dakota and it was January. So it was right at the beginning of January. The season was still open. And I was hunting in a T-shirt in January because, uh, and it was a warm day, but, you know, when you think about hunting in January, you don't think of walking around in a T-shirt, but you're moving so much, you know, new people will always overdress on yeah. a cold day because they'll get up, they'll go outside, they'll stand in the driveway, they'll start shivering, and then they'll they'll start walking, and by about a quarter mile into the walk, they're shedding clothes and carrying stuff and sweating, and um, it's great because, you, you know, you can hunt on a cold day and you don't get cold beautiful yeah that was pretty cool 
do you think, what do you think is your most favorite, other than the state that you live in, obviously, um, what do you think is your most favorite state to hunt birds in? Well, let's not say my the state I live in is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I live here and I like it, but it's not my favorite. Um, South Dakota is an incredible state, um, just in so many ways. And I'm, you know, I'm not far from it. Um, and I'm, I'm in Minnesota for a number of reasons, but I, I could, I could move to South Dakota. You know, I grew up hunting in Wisconsin. Um, I grew up deer hunting and waterfowl hunting in Wisconsin. Uh, I lived in North Dakota. North Dakota is a great state too. Um, I got to bow hunt in the Badlands, which is one of the coolest places on the planet. Um, yeah. South Coast has got a little bit of everything. They got great waterfall hunting. They got great pheasant hunting. They got good fishing. They got a number. Of, I mean, don't go to South Dakota. Anybody listening, stay out of South Dakota. It's no good. You won't like it. <laughs> right. It's terrible. Right. Um, it's expensive. You, you know, won't catch any fish. You won't, yeah. you won't get any deer. <laughs> <laughs> but I've hunted. You know, I've hunted in Texas a few times, and Texas is. I was just telling this to somebody the other day. Texas is one of the most fun places to uh, to, to to be able to go and hunt if, if you have access to land. You know, there's no real public land down there, so it's tough to get on places. But if you if you get in down there in a cool place, just you can do just about it. You can hunt just about anything. Uh, you can you can hunt it just about any way you want to. Mm-hmm. Texas is a lot of fun. Huh, that's um, interesting. But what's really this is, I'm going to throw a curveball at you oh boy. because one of my favorite, one of my favorite places to go to now is not a state at all. It's a province and that's Saskatchewan. And, uh, I work with a couple of fishing lodges and hunting lodges, I guess up there too. And I spend, um, a good chunk of my summer in Saskatchewan now fishing. And I've been able to go up there and do some waterfall hunting as well in the fall. And it's, uh, really? it's, uh, it's neat country up there. I love it. Um, I, I could see myself living in South Dakota or Saskatchewan at some point, um, when I decide to retire, if that ever happens. I love South Dakota. It's, it's legitimately one of my all time favorite states as well. I love, I mean, I've been out there turkey hunting how many times and just this, you know, in a couple of weeks I'll be out there ice fishing. I just, South Dakota is definitely my jam. I think anybody who hunts or fishes there would say the same. Mm-hmm. I would, I, I can't believe not to totally completely switch subjects but i can't believe how hard it has been to find like a fishing guide in north dakota tons of them in south dakota but not so many in north dakota it's kind of odd well guiding rules are a little bit different in north dakota and i and and to be fair i know more about the hunting guiding rules versus fishing but i'd I'd assume it'd be pretty similar um like finding hunting guides you can't find very many of those either but you go to south dakota particularly in the spring and there's a spring snow goose guide in just about every section nowadays yeah. it's, a, it's an absolute zoo over there in the spring and that's because the rules are different for guides and in north dakota to be a hunting guide you have to i think you have to be trained in cpr you have to have a guide license i think you have to have a um, you have to pass a test. I think you have to have uh, a lease of a thousand acres. I can, I have never honestly wow. there were too many things for me to even look into, so I don't remember all the requirements. But there's more requirements in North Dakota than a lot of states. So that there, I'm sure there's something That's similar for sure. fishing guys yeah, too. So for sure. I didn't even know there was a spring. I'm um, now <laughs> here. Hello, Google machine. Let me just go ahead and Google mm-hmm. snow goose hunting in the it's spring. A, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a called a conservation order. So what happened is, is the snow goose population got so big uh, in the mid 90s, I believe, is when this uh, when this took place that they were destroying, and they still are. They're destroying their habitat, their breeding grounds in the tundra. Just Google snow goose effect on tundra breeding grounds, and I guarantee you, you'll find a picture that'll come up where they fenced off. I can't remember how. It's just a small little square that they fenced off. And around it looks like a golf course green. And inside that fence, it's like, uh, it looks like CRP grass. So the snow geese just decimate the tundra up there, the vegetation. And there's not a lot of vegetation to begin with up there. And the snow geese are, are trashing it. So to control the population, they started this conservation order. So they won't call it a hunting season. It's a conservation order. So in most states, uh, particularly in that central flyway, there's no limits on snow geese in the spring. You can use electronic collars. You can use uh, unplugged shotguns. So a lot of guys will put extension tubes on their guns and load up with 10, 12 shells in their shotgun. And when a, 
when a flock of snows come in, uh, you know, pop, 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 pop. Yeah. If you don't run your gun dry, you're not doing it right. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just, it's just about numbers. And that's why if you, if you, these people are going on YouTube, you'll watch snow goose videos where the goal will be to shoot triple digits, you know, a hundred bird day. Oh and as somebody that spent time guiding snow geese, that, that sucks because that makes it hard for us guides because then these people come in thinking they're going to shoot a hundred birds every day. And that's just not, it's just not realistic. Yeah. It's doable and it's legal. And that's about the only thing you can do where you can shoot that many birds. And that's what makes it so much fun, but it's a lot of work. It's expensive and it's usually real muddy, huh. but it's a lot of fun. This is neat. Now I'm super fascinated. Thank you for adding yet yeah. another trip that I'm going to go ahead and add because there ain't shit going on in April around here. So, like... <laughs> it's a blast. And, and if nothing else, do this. Even if you don't hunt, I always encourage people. I did this when I first learned about it. Uh, again, when I moved to North Dakota, and I was doing radio up there. I I learned about this migration and I learned what it looked like. So one day in the spring, I just drove. I just got on 94 and I started driving to the central part of the state. And then I got off on some exit and I just hit back roads, gravel. And I just started crisscrossing my way across the prairie. And then all of a sudden I saw it. And on a heavy migration day, which is usually like a, a light north wind day, if they're, if they're pushing uh, south in the fall or if they're pushing north, it's just a light wind. And that, that leading edge bird, you will just see strings of snow geese across the entire horizon. That's it's not, crazy. it's unlike anything else I've ever seen. If you're a, a bird hunter or a waterfowl person, you have to at least go witness it. Even if you don't, hunting it might, might get frustrating, <laughs> but seeing it is, is uh, unreal. That's neat. You'll see fields with 20, 30,000 birds feeding in it, and they're just noisy, hopping over each other, chasing each other around. They're voracious feeders they'll clean out a field in no time and um they're they're uh adaptable and i mean there's a reason that their numbers exploded uh they think that there's 30 million of them or something in the, the mid-continent population the central flyway population it's, and the numbers are crazy that's nuts it looks like it's a really short i'm just and i just grabbed a website um that offers like guided hunts and stuff on in south dakota it looks like it's the season's only about a month long and it's funny how from it goes from Arkansas to Nebraska to Minnesota to South Dakota or whatever, you know, I'm sure following their migration, like you said, it doesn't seem like yeah. it's a very long season, but then I think about it. I'm like, that's a whole month. That's a lot of birds heading North. It is. <laughs> and I, and, and legally the season dates are probably longer. There's it's, legally, it's probably open for, I don't know, two months, maybe I, I'm not sure, but you'll never, generally never hunt them that long because yeah. unless there's a bunch of storms that keep the birds from pushing north they'll just follow the snow line as it melts so usually they push through and and then it's you got to put on miles that once the lead edge birds the lead edge birds are the ones that are fun to watch but hard to hunt yeah and once they push through, you just find little pockets of the younger birds that, that trail up. And there'll, there'll be birds hitting Canada that uh, the lead edge birds will hit in Canada. There'll still be some snows down in Texas and Arkansas that are just slow to move. Sure. But uh, it's uh, it's quite the migration. This is really quite fascinating. I guess I, I don't know. I guess I think in the spring, the only thing I think of in the spring is like trout and turkey. It never mm. occurred to me that there might be goose hunts this is pretty cool hmm. yeah i mean you got to find the you got to be on the migration yeah. routes and that one uh, that uh from arkansas texas mm -hmm. nebraska missouri south dakota north dakota is kind of the the route sure. the main route anyway you can find them in other states too but um sure yeah it's i don't know it it's it's a lot of fun um Sometimes, again, you're just shaking your fists at the sky more times than not. But when the stars align, uh, you won't find anything else like it. I'm sure. I'm sure. So speaking of your career in radio, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about how you got into the outdoors and how your outdoor communicator career came to be? Sure. 
I uh, realized when I was in high school, I had zero talent or motivation to do anything with my life. So radio <laughs> was perfect. So, <laughs> I, uh, now I, you know, I grew up hunting and fishing. Our family um, was into the outdoors. You know, part of my, um, part of my uh, love for Saskatchewan comes from our, our family. My grandpa was born up there and his, grandparents homesteaded in a lot uh they came from sweden and homesteaded in saskatchewan and then half the family moved to northwestern excuse me northwestern minnesota and a couple of men they bounced back and forth between minnesota and saskatchewan and uh they grew up moose hunting and duck hunting um pheasant hunting and then uh, of course fishing too so I, i grew up in an outdoor family and then ended up getting a, I got a Scott, my uncle was in radio and TV. So he kind of got me interested in it. So I looked into radio school, I ended up getting a scholarship to radio school, whatever, and then bounced around. Um, I did a lot of music radio. So I, I, of course you, you work at country stations most of the time when you're starting out. And then I, I ran pretty much every rock station that was in Fargo uh, during my time there either was program director or was on it. And then um, and I, I started running the KFAN affiliate up there and got started doing an outdoor radio show while I was there. And I was running three stations. And one day they decided they wanted to change the format on one of the stations. So management came to me and, and I'd been in this building at this group for 10 years. And they said, uh, um, we're going to change the format on the rock station. I said, oh, OK, neat. <laughs> and um, they said, well, you. <laughs> okay, that sucks, but all right. Cool, okay. <laughs> so, what's next? Yeah, and we're letting uh, a couple of you go. So, uh, you got the rest of the day to say goodbye and clean out your desk. Oh, oh my God. Hey, okay. Yep. So, I decided that's when I decided uh, full time radio, corporate radio wasn't for me anymore because I was working 10 hours a day, at least six days a week. Saturday mornings, I'd be at the Fargo Dome. We were the NDSU Bison uh, flagship station so saturday mornings every other saturday in september and october i'd find myself handing out t-shirts to drunk college kids on a saturday morning while all my buddies were shooting mallards out in the middle of you know cornfields and i was like something something ain't right here something <laughs> something's got to change and i walked in one day and they, they said see you later i almost thanked them on my way out the door and uh i started working for this outdoor magazine called minnesota sporting journal and uh, within about a year or so, I ended up buying the owner out and taking it over. I started a radio show uh, to go along with it. And then, um, you know, magazines have been a bit of a struggle. Newspapers, magazines, the print industry, traditional media has been a struggle. It's well documented. So I ended up stopping. Well, I got a TV job and the TV show had a magazine, too. And they said, in order for you to take this job, you have to stop publishing your magazine. So, what? <laughs> neat. Yeah, yeah. I'm done with corporate, like corporations and full time businesses. So I so I stopped publishing my magazine and it was it the printing industry was tough anyway, so it was probably gonna be I was probably gonna end it anyway, but this just kind of forced my hand and um we did that show for one year and then they they let everybody go after telling us they were gonna do it for three years. So I was like, Oh, okay, neat. This is fun. So I, I took the the <laughs> the the radio show and i've just concentrated on growing this radio show and at the same time that they ended that show uh prairie sportsman which i host now was coming back and it had been on a five-year hiatus and it's produced by this uh this little pbs affiliate in western minnesota and granite falls called pioneer pbs and i i wanted to live in that area anyway I was living in Brainerd, Minnesota, and I wanted to move back to Western Minnesota. So I, I called them up. I said, hey, you're bringing the show back. I'd love to be the host. Um, and they said, okay. And I came back and interviewed and ended up getting that job and moving back to Minnesota. So now I, I host that show, and I do Sporting Journal Radio and Podcasts as the radio show. So the radio show I started with that magazine, uh, we're about to hit our 500th episode. And that's a weekly show. So that's 500 weeks, whatever that equals out to be, 10 years or whatever it is. Sure. Um, so that, so now I've been growing that show and then, uh, the TV show, Prairie Sportsman, uh, and then I do a, a couple of YouTube shows. One is Tasm TV from one of the, one of the lodges up in Saskatchewan. And I do a couple other podcasts and I play with my dogs and I take <laughs> pictures of pheasants 
and I do some waterfall guiding and uh, here and there. My nephew Dan's taken over my job in the waterfall guide business a little bit. I still do it a little bit, but yeah. he's uh, he's a little bit younger and likes likes those hours a little more than I do. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do a little bit of everything. That's cool. I, I call it diversifying after after basically getting let go from two corporate jobs for essentially no fault of my own. Uh, I said, I'm not going down that road anymore. So I built my own business and, and do a little bit of everything. Good for you. Is the, is the Saskatchewan like lodges and stuff, for example, that you work with, is that with your media company? Is that what you do for them? Yeah. Yep. That's so neat. I do a lot of their marketing and create, create the marketing materials. Um, I create Taz and TV, the TV show for Taz and Lake Lodge. I, I, uh, one of our clients caught what we estimated to be a 72 pound lake trout a couple of years ago. So the place is pretty special. It's a, as far north in Saskatchewan as you can go. It's by float plane only. I, in fact, um, bringing it back to dogs for one minute, I got to bring Nika up there uh, a couple of years ago. So I got to bring her on a float plane, which I, if you would have told me I'd be bringing my dog on a float plane, I would have said you were crazy. But, uh, <laughs> so I got, I got to bring Meek on a float plane, and then she stood, stayed on the island with me for – was I on the island for almost, a, I suppose, a month, five oh weeks, God. four or five weeks. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it was awesome. And there's a lot of black bears up there, of course. So one of my favorite stories from up there is Mika basically had the run of the island, and I was out doing some filming on the lake. And uh, I came in, and uh, – there were some guests there, some of our clients, and they came up like, oh, you missed uh, an exciting afternoon. I said, really? What happened? Well, they showed me a picture, and it's a picture of Mika laying kind of on the on the beach in front of the lodge, facing the lodge, and, and behind her, there's a bear walking right behind her down to, down to the water. And it must, the wind must have been just right that she had no idea it was there, because normally she can smell them anywhere on the island and she'll sit there and bark at them and all of a sudden you'll realize there's a bear nearby <laughs> this one walked up right behind her without her seeing it <laughs> clients called her in and brought her inside so she was she was fine but um, oh my god yeah so i i do uh you know i'll make a work trade show booths for them i'll make brochures i do all the photography i build their websites uh i go up there and and um you know basically make all their marketing materials for them and do a little bit of fishing myself and you know, yeah. um, have fun. Cool. Very cool. Well, it sounds like you are legitimately living everybody's dream that listens to this podcast. <laughs> it's not bad. I can't complain. Well, I mean, it's not handing t-shirts out to drunk kids on yeah. a Saturday morning right. at the Fargo Dome, which is fine. I'm not trying to knock the buys them by any means. Just not for me. All right. But if somebody wanted to get so let's give them let's give the listeners your social media web your social media rundown and then say there are what would be corporate sponsors or something listening to the show um if they wanted to get a hold of you with your media company where would they go to find out more information about you Sure I appreciate that um so the TV show is called Prairie Sportsman that airs on it actually airs on PBS stations in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota and Wyoming I think it airs about 400 times a year on broadcast. It's unreal. Uh, it's on YouTube, Facebook, all that good stuff too. But praysportsman.org is a TV show. Uh, sportingjournalradio.com is, uh, my radio show and podcast. That's a video podcast. It's like a, it's like you're watching a, a TV show really. Uh, so we do all that on YouTube and, and Facebook. It's on 30 radio stations too around the region, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Dakotas. Uh, but it's all video online and all the digital platforms now. It's we're on Rumble. So all you Rumble fans out there, <laughs> all you people. Are we still on Rumble, Dan? Maybe. <laughs> we might not be on Rumble anymore. We were on Rumble. Anyway, uh, Instagram, Sporting Journal Radio, all that good stuff. Um, what else? Taz and TV. Oh, uh, Taz and TV. It's pretty cool to watch. If you want to see some really big fish, I caught a 50-inch pike up there last year. Um, it's a special place, uh, Tazan TV, Tazan Lake Lodge on YouTube or TazanLake.com, uh, is that website. We've got Camp Grayling, which is FishCampGrayling.com. I caught my first grayling up there. We walleye fish, we fly fished for walleyes up there last summer. It was unreal. Two feet of water, caught one, doubled up on walleyes for like hours. It was incredible. That's at Camp Grayling. Um, 
Trails End Outfitters in Saskatchewan. They have uh, deer and bear hunting and then uh, <laughs> walleye fishing on Tobin Lake, which which is where the world record walleye came out of through the ice. Uh, <laughs> so we wow. we got some. If you want to hunt, fish, just about anything, we got you covered. And honestly, you can find all this stuff. I should have just told you this. All this stuff is on my personal site, which is brettamundson.com. I got links to everything I do on there. Explains it all. Uh, brettamundson.com. Um that's probably the easy. I probably should have just led with that. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> I'll add that to but, the show notes in big bold letters. Just go here. <laughs> yeah, it's just easy. Easier. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, very cool. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to come on to chat about some about your dogs and everything that you're up to. And now I want to go to Saskatchewan and now I want to go spring goose hunting. So thanks for that. I'm sure my boyfriend will be thrilled. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he'll enjoy it. Everybody should do it. Um, everybody should do it. It does. The, uh, they're just some unbelievable experiences. And if you love the outdoors, you're going to enjoy Saskatchewan. It's unreal. And the spring snow goose season is just uh, an amazing spectacle. So everyone should do it. Well, awesome. All right. Well, I will link to a lot of that stuff in the show notes. And I appreciate you taking the time to come on. You bet. And if you guys come up, we'll play Iron Maiden in the boat. Yeah. So that's no problem. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's awesome.